Good evening. My name is Don Stelluto, and I am the Associate Director for the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. Before we begin tonight's lecture by Dr. Kohler, I would like to ask that if you have a cell phone with you, please turn it to the off or to the silent mode. If you have a camera with, a, with you, please refrain from any flash photography during the lecture. If time permits, after his lecture, and we've sort of scheduled it so that we can do this, Dr. Kola has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience. The question and answer period will be moderated by Jim McAdams, William M. Scholl Professor of International Affairs and Director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Professor McAdams will also provide closing comments for this special evening. At this time, I am very pleased to welcome to the podium Roger Wong, the Martin J. Gillen Dean for the Mendoza College of Business, and Kenneth R. Meyer, Professor of Global Investment Management. Dean Wong, who is a dean, who as dean and a, a professor, is quite accustomed to great questions on a global scale, will render the welcome to you and to our special guests for this evening's lecture. Roger. Thank you, Don, and thank you to all of you for coming to tonight's uh, special event here. Welcome to the beautiful Jordan Auditorium and to the Mendoza College of Business. It is a great uh, pleasure to welcome you, and here um, our mission is to challenge students and ourselves to ask more of business and to understand business has always been in service to the greater good. The distinctive mission is one we likewise apply to what we do outside the classroom. We are committed to the principles that business should be part of the solution for major issues and that the human community always come before the business community. As a Catholic business school, we strive to be challenged and inspired by the moral imperatives of our faith. It is therefore an honor to welcome Dr. Kohler as our guest and our speaker for this evening. This auditorium at this university is a fitting venue for Dr. Kohler, whose many decisions and actions in global finance and political leadership have been guided by moral imperatives and focus on the common good. Shared goals and pursuits, the eradication of poverty, and debt relief for the poorest countries of the world. Welcome, Dr. Kohler. We are honored to have you with us this evening, and we are very interested in your lecture, Citizenship in the Global Age, Personal Reflections on a Political Conundrum. I would also like to welcome his distinguished wife, former First Lady Eva Louise Kohler. Mrs. Kohler has worked as a teacher and become one of the leading advocates in Europe for research into rare diseases. Since 2005, she has been the patroness of the German Alliance for Rare Diseases, a leadership position in which she advocates for patients and patient organizations, supports cooperations and information exchange between experts, and promotes increased research in rare diseases. I also extend my warm welcome to the daughter Orike, who is currently a postdoctoral student in English literature at the Institute of English Studies in Germany. At this time, I'm very pleased to welcome to the podium Brad Gregory, the Dorothy G. Griffin Collegiate Chair and Professor of Finance and Director of the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Studies. I am decidedly a professor of history and not a professor of finance, so just <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean Huang, for your welcome, for hosting this lecture. It is a great honor and a genuine pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Horst Kuhler, who served as the ninth president of the Federal Republic of Germany from 2004 to 2010. As a civil servant, a professional economist, a political leader, and an international diplomat, Dr. Kuhler has distinguished himself 
through a lifetime of dedicated service guided by a commitment to the common good not only of his fellow German citizens, but of his fellow human beings around the world. After earning his doctorate in economics and political science at the University of Tübingen in 1976, President Köhler began his public service in Germany's ministries of economics and finance. Starting in 1990, as state secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Dr. Köhler negotiated and oversaw the monetary integration of the former East German Democratic Republic in a newly reunited Germany. In addition, he was responsible for negotiating and managing the withdrawal of the 480,000 Soviet troops stationed in the GDR before 1989 and served as chief negotiator for the Maastricht Treaty of the European Monetary Union as well as the personal representative of German, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl for the World Economic Summits. On the world stage, Dr. Köhler has repeatedly demonstrated his commitment to improve human lives in ways consistent with values and ideals shared by the University of Notre Dame. In 1998, as president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London, Dr. Köhler sought to bolster democracy and a market economy in Eastern European states previously under Soviet control. Starting in 2000, as the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, he worked to resolve financial crises in several countries, to diminish poverty in Africa, and to institute reforms through which the IMF would do more to alleviate material deprivation. He steered the IMF toward debt relief for the poorest African countries, seeking to foster their macroeconomic stability. He also approached globalization with an eye toward its effects on human flourishing, or the absence thereof, seeking a more robust partnership between Europe and the African continent. Significantly, and not by accident, Dr. Kuller's success has derived from his consistent adoption of two practices to which we at Notre Dame are also deeply committed, sustained engagement in civil dialogue and careful consideration of the ethical dimension of our actions, knowing that neither economics nor the pursuit of profit are independent of morality. As president of Germany, Dr. Kuller worked to build a better national education system and continued his efforts to blunt the human costs of unrestrained globalization. He called on fellow Germans to assume a greater role in international affairs, and in so doing, used a phrase that in fact echoed an icon in Notre Dame's history when he challenged his fellow German citizens to become, quote, a force for good in the world. As I'm sure many of you, if not all of you know, but perhaps Dr. Kuller does not, in 1842, Father Edward Soren, the university's founder, wrote to his religious superior in France, Father Basil Moreau, expressing his aspiration that the University of Notre Dame du Lac would become, quote, one of the most powerful means for doing good in this country. Following his years as the German president, Dr. Kuller has remained active as a statesman diplomat and advisor Ona Grenzen, without borders. In 2012 and 2013, he served on the International Advisory Board established by United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to devise a global development agenda beyond 2015. Last year and this year, he co-chaired with Kofi Annan, a special panel of the African Development Bank devoted to its new strategic priorities. Most recently, Earlier this year, Dr. Kuller was appointed by the current United States Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, as his personal envoy for the Western Sahara, the responsibilities for which Dr. Kuller will take up immediately following his departure from Notre Dame. We are privileged to have with us today a man who will not simply speak about citizenship in a global era, but will do so from the experience of having been himself an exemplary global citizen in many different capacities, in many different places around the world, over more than four decades, and with such manifold success. There are literally few others in the world better qualified to deliver a lecture entitled Citizenship in a Global Age, Personal Reflections on a Political Conundrum. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Horst Kuller.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, I caution you, maybe this applause was premature. <laughs> <laughs> dear Brett um, Gregory, dear James McAdams, thank you both of you for hosting me and my family here at Notre Dame. Dear Roger Wang, ladies and gentlemen, but first and foremost, dear students of Notre Dame University, if you look at the big picture of history, it is not a matter of course that I'm speaking here today. A few hundred years ago, it would have been unthinkable that a Protestant speak at a Catholic university. <laughs> Seven decades ago, let's say in the year I was born, 1943, my country, was the biggest enemy of the United States until it was, thankfully, defeated in a war which cost millions of lives. And finally, as the son of simple farmers who became refugees twice within the first 10 years of my life, I really wasn't predestined to be called President Köhler one day and give a speech at a prestigious American university. And yet, I'm here. And none of you seem to want to go for my throat because I'm a Protestant. <laughs> or because I'm German. None of you seems to question my legitimacy to speak because I wasn't born into a family of wealth or nobility or fame. All of this, if you look at the big picture of history, is not a matter of course. None of it should be taken for granted. Times have changed, and they have changed for the better. Humanity has made progress within the last few decades that would have been unimaginable for the grandparents of your grandparents. Statistically speaking, the species of Homo sapiens lives healthier, longer, and more peaceful lives than ever before. The average life expectancy improved more over the last 50 years than over the entire 1,000 years before. Over roughly the same period of time, from 1960 to 2015, Global child mortality rates were reduced by more than 70%. In China alone, over half a billion people were able to lift themselves out of extreme poverty since 19, 1990. And despite some horrendous conflicts raging today, the world has never in its history seen a lower rate of violent death than during the last 25 years. All of this is the result of an unprecedented progress in science, technology, communications, but perhaps, perhaps most of all, it is the result of a global exchange of goods, ideas, knowledge, and yes, people. It is the result of an ever pending web of economic and political connectivity which allowed our economies to thrive on the international division of labor, which allowed our scientists to learn from each other and our politicians to cooperate with each other. In short, most of humanity's progress during the last 50 years is an outcome of globalization. And yet I'm speaking to you at a moment in history when public discourse is marked not by content about what humanity has achieved by coming closer together, not by optimism about what there is still to attain, but rather by an acute sense of fragility, of disorientation, and of tension. 
Many people all around the world seem to have lost faith in the most powerful creed of modernity, that my children will be better off than I am today. We live in a, in a time of crises. The refugee crisis, the chaos in the Middle West, the worries about the stability of the international financial system, the ongoing environmental disasters in many corners of the planet, North Korea terror, terrorism. What is especially worrisome about these crises is that there doesn't seem to be a basis for confidence about how to really get out of the several messes we are in. Maybe the biggest crisis of all is the crisis of confidence in the ability of politics to find lasting solutions. As a consequence, many are ready to blame their uneasiness about the future on the very phenomenon which made our current level of unprecedented well-being possible. Globalization. In Europe, in, Amer in America, and many other parts of the world, a lot of people turn to leaders who preach not cooperation, but confrontation, not openness, but retreat. This is the paradox of our time. At no point in history has it been clearer. Our challenges are complex. Our challenges are long-term, and our challenges are global. And yet, those political forces are on the rise, whose answers are simple, whose answers are short-term, and whose answers are national. Tonight, I want to try to make some sense of this paradox. Try to understand the ambivalence of living in a globalized time. What is the role of national politics in an ever more connected world? How do we as individuals, as voters, as consumers, as human beings, in short as citizens, fit into this overwhelming web of interconnectedness? In my speech tonight, I would like to offer one short answer, answer and one longer answer. The first answer is about the downsides of glo globalization, about the destructive force of a world economy, which in its current form is ruthless to the weak, brutal to our planet, and constantly trying to evade rules. The second longer answer will take us to the vision of a great transformation which is needed in our economies and societies. This answer will analyze our concept of politics, our understanding of national interest, which I believe have to be redefined in light of the realities of this 21st century. Finally, this second answer will be about responsibility and identity, which will help us understand what it means to be a citizen in a global age. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't think of any better place to search for these answers than at the University of Notre Dame. An American university founded by a Frenchman calling its athletic teams the Fighting Irish. <laughs> a university which is part of the oldest and, by definition, most global institution of the world, the Catholic Church. Taking a global perspective is part of your DNA, which is why I am excited and honored to be able to have this conversation with you tonight. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Those are the words with which Charles Dickens famously started his novel on the French Revolution, A Tale of Two Cities. 
Is this the motto of this new millennium, another age of gigantic yet contradictory transition? After all, the balance sheet of our globalized present is not altogether rosy. The immense progress I have described earlier has come at a hefty price. And the invoice we are presented with now creates huge challenges for the future of this planet. Let me give you two pieces of evidence for that. Exhibit A, global warming. The current models of economic growth which have brought the industrialized world extraordinary prosperity are coming up against their limits. Nature does not allow us to grow the way we were used to. The warning signs can be breathed from New Delhi to Beijing. They can be felt from the Sahel zone to the Houston area. They can be seen on the mountain tops of the Alps and the glaciers of the Antarctic. The unrelenting burning of fossil fuels, a major driver of growth in the past, has increased the concentration of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere to unprecedented levels. 15 of the 16 hottest years on record have been in this 21st century. Most ecological consequences of global warming will be irreversible. The climate is not like an indoor plant. If the plant dries up, you just buy a new one. But there's no such thing as a store for replacement e ecosystems. In many areas, we are approaching dangerous tipping points which, once crossed, may cause abrupt and irreversible changes to the Earth's eco Earth ecosystem. That is, by the way, what makes fighting climate change unique. Politics and policies are confronted with a new quality of, challenge, quality of challenge. They need to meet concrete deadlines. You cannot ask the climate for an extension just because you failed to do your homework. You can't just make a deal with the climate. The method of buying time, which is so popular in politics, reaches its limits when it comes to global warming. But the real reason why the global economy cannot continue to grow in the same way as it has in the past becomes evident if we look at the global ecological question and the global social question at the same time. I'm talking about global population growth, which will reach almost 10 billion people in 2050. I'm talking about the more than 700 million people still living in extreme poverty and the growth of the middle class, global middle class, decarbonizing the economies of industrialized countries would be difficult enough. But at the same time, we must enable massive growth in poor countries where people need hospitals, schools, streets, and electricity, where they need education, jobs, and incomes. After all, but which natural resources should feed this growth? That's the central question. After all, we are already pushing our planet's boundaries. If everybody consumed like we do in the US and in Europe, we would need several planets in reserve. Before I get to an answer, let me present you exhibit B for the downside uh, of globalization as we know it. Exhibit B. Inequality. The Serbian-American economist Branko Milanovic helps us to understand who have been the winners and losers of globalization since 1990. While inequality between countries has been reduced, namely because in China and other parts of Asia, 
Poverty was reduced and a new middle class has emerged. Inequality within countries has actually increased. The big losers of globalization in relative terms have been the poorer 50% in industrialized countries who saw no, who saw no, no, who saw not only, uh, no, or only little increase in income. <laughs> I had to stump. The big winners are to be found in a new class of global plutocrats, as Milanovic calls them. The super rich who have seen increases in wealth which go beyond anything a normal brain can imagine. Globalization as we know it has increased inequality. The international division of labor, the driving force of globalization, means structural change as industries are dying in one country and are being reborn in another country where they are more competitive. Digitalization and robotization are further accelerating structural change in industries and labor markets. This structural change is not bad, bad per se, but it has to be managed. And in most industrialized countries, in most, it has, hasn't been managed well. Too much time was lost clinging to the technologies and structures of the past instead of embracing those of the future. Furthermore, little attention has been paid to distributing the benefits of globalization within countries. But all of that is not an argument against globalization. That is an argument against badly managed globalization. Ladies and gentlemen, our globalized modernity has created a strange concurrence of construction and destruction. The contradictions of globalization are felt by people all over the world. Many are hurt by it, and many are rightfully angry because oftentimes those who are hurt the most have contributed the least to the problem. Climate change affects already today millions of people, nomads in the Sahel, inhabitants of Pacific islands, or farmers in the Andes. These are certainly not the culprits for global warming. Inequality as a result of badly managed structural change in, in, in industrialized countries like the US or Germany or France hits those the most who have the least influence in political decision making. So yes, I can understand that people are angry at globalization, that they are unsettled by its contradictions. The speed and profoundness of the changes in the last decades are overwhelming for many. It is a world where politics seems to have lost control in many areas and pe people have the feeling that control over their own lives is slowly slipping away. But you know what makes me angry? It makes me angry to see charlatans exploiting people's anxieties for their own political gain. They will make life harder for exactly those people they are pretending to defend. All the populists have in common that they do not offer real alternatives. After all, it is no coincidence that the rising stars of the extreme right in Europe and the US deny man-made climate change when they are confronted with a problem which we very obviously cannot be solved by a nation state alone, the problem is declared to be non-existent. Summing up my first answer, no, globalization has not been all good, but it can be made better. It can be made better. And this leads me to my second answer. 
taking seriously the uneasiness of people requires taking seriously the challenges of globalization and the challenges which this planet as a whole is facing. Demonizing globalization altogether doesn't solve any problem, but instead creates a multitude of others. To make globalization work for all, you must not ignore its complexities and contradictions, but face them. To make it better, we must not ridicule international cooperation, but embrace it. What does that mean for our understanding of politics and for our understanding of citizenship? Ladies and gentlemen, you still remember the list of crises that I mentioned at the beginning of my speech. I believe that all these crises are manifestations of an ambivalent globalization. And they all have one thing in common. They cannot be solved by any nation state alone. Yet most of our national politics still fails to grasp that very fundamental reality of the 21st century, a reality which makes this century so different from all before. Interdependence. Interdependence. The world is our neighbor, and most of our neighbor's problems will eventually become also our own. The world has witnessed this during the financial crisis, when the failing housing market of a single country caused a global recession of gigantic proportions. We have witnessed it in the Middle East where a chain reaction triggered by ill-advised interventions like in Iraq or in Libya has led to a massive refugee crisis and 890,000 refugees flowing into Germany in the year 2015. We witnessed it during the Ebola crisis, where a deadly virus in West Africa put hospitals all over the world in high alert. And when a country like China thinks about a quota for electric mobility, car manufacturers from Germany to the US frantically try to understand what that, that means for their business models. The list could go on and on. Policies pursue, pursued at one end of the globe have an effect on the other end. From that perspective, there's almost no policy, no political strategy, which could correctly be described as purely national. And yet, many in politics, especially self-acclaimed realists, still have an understanding of national interest which has, in my view, little to do with reality. They see, see the world as an ocean on which every state rows its own boat, while international uh, politics is charged with ensuring that everybody can row unhindered and that the boats do not collide. That's even a modest uh, description of the problem. Yet I believe we are all in the same boat and have been for some time. But so many people in the boat are so busy defending and taking care of their own oars that nobody can or wants to deal with the leak that is plain for all to see in the middle of the boat. Two things, I believe, are important when talking about the notion of national interest. Firstly, conflicting interests along nationally defined lines are more often than not an illusion. The winners and losers in the wake of certain decisions are not entire states and entire populations, but specific groups or branches of industry within these states. A farmer in Minnesota might have more common interests with a fertilizer manufacturer in China than with a banker in New York. 
Any political actor blocking a cooperative solu global solution in the name of national interest is often acting against a great many interests within his own nation. Secondly, in the 21st century, most conflicting interests are not between us and them, but between us and our grandchildren, between short-term and long-term interests. In the long term, our fates are so inextricably linked that the future we look into, that the few, further we look into the future, the more the interests of different countries converge. Climate change is the best example for this. No country, no matter how rich and powerful it may be, can maintain its prosperity in the long term if it fails to take into account the prospects and well-being of other countries. Yes, there is, there is such a thing as a global interest. There will be no security in Europe if its neighbor's continent, Africa, which will host over 2.5 billion inhabitants in 2050. That's a quarter of the world population in 2050, cannot give a perspective to its huge youth population. There will be no protection of America's coastal cities if sea levels continue to rise due to global warming. There is no recipe for fighting climate change if the economies of the South continue to grow in the same polluting and resource-intensive way of today's industrialized countries. Of course, the existence of such a thing as a global interest doesn't mean that humanity doesn't have enemies. There certainly is no common interest to be found with barbarians like the leaders of ISIS. Neither go, does goal, uh, global interest mean everyone agreeing on everything. There are always going to be divergent objectives and interests. They are one of the fundamental constants in politics. When I was managing director of the IMF, a truly global institution, we worked hard to solve a number of economic crises on all ends of the planet from Brazil to Turkey to Ghana. We certainly didn't do it by simply singing Kumbaya. <laughs> there were hard fights, tough negotiations, and oftentimes pressures from all kinds of sides pursuing their interests, pushing their inst the institution to favor one part of resolution or over another. To find a solution to a certain crisis, I had to get the board of directors to agree. 24 people, important people, representing different countries with diverging economic views. And I had to get the respective country on board, which was always mired in its own mess of conflicting internal interests. But for all differences, ladies and gentlemen, dear stu students, I always discovered, I discovered that there is common ground. There always is common ground. That is my experience over my lifetime. I learned that it is not the fact that conflicting objectives exist that is, is the problem, but the way we deal with them. And it would be a huge step forward if the trade-off between today and tomorrow was clearly stated when decisions are made. If we openly presented our own interests and perceive the concerns of others as legitimate interests and if we dealt more openly with the question as to who are the winners and who are the losers of certain decisions, both in the short and in the long term, both in our own country and in other countries. This could be a basis, a basis for a new understanding of the relationship between national politics and global solutions, where both levels feed into each other 
instead of hindering each other. Please don't get me wrong. This is not about the emasculation of the nation state. This is about the emancipation, the paradox of national politics in the 21st century could be that by sharing certain tasks with other states, the nation state in fact retains its ability to act in the face of a globalized economy and a common ecosphere. Such an understanding of national politics could be the basis for a new paradigm in international politics, a paradigm of global partnership, a new spirit of cooperation for mutual benefit, solidarity, and mutual accountability. Nothing else is needed if we want to solve humanity's biggest challenge. If you remember what I said earlier about climate change and population growth, about inequality and economic growth models, then it is evident that this biggest, uh, it is evident what this biggest challenge is. Giving every human being the chance to live a life in dignity, but doing so without destroying our planet. That's our biggest challenge. Fighting extreme poverty and protecting our planet is deeply intertwined we cannot do one without the other. Doing both is in the immediate interest of all of us. And how do we do it? Well, we need nothing less than a great transformation of our societies and economies. The transformation of developing economies, which is crucial to fight poverty, requires a transformation in industrialized industries. Uh, industries, uh, in countries. We in the rich countries, in Germany, in Europe, in the US, need to change the way we produce and consume energy, how we travel and transport goods, how we eat and how we work. This is the reality. We have to prove that it is possible to decouple economic well-being from the overuse of resources and from carbon emissions, to overcome extreme poverty in Africa, Asia, or Latin America, we have to push for a global enabling environment, for better trade regimes, and fairer international tax rules, which allow poor countries to process their own resources and profit from them. Sounds like a naive vision. Well, despite all the bad news that we are used to, I believe we might be closer to realizing this vision than ever before. From today's point of view, it is almost a miracle what happened two years ago in New York and in Paris. I'm talking about the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which both were agreed on in 2015 by all members of the United Nations. All members of the United Nations. The core of the 2030 Agenda is a list of 17 goals which uh, humanity wants to achieve by the year 2030. It brings together the economic, ecological, and social dimension of human development. A universal agenda that requires change in the North and in the South, in the East and the West. Taken together, these two agreements present a powerful political orientation for the great transformation. We want to be the first generation to end extreme poverty and the last generation to be threatened by climate, climate change. That's the vision. Both agreements show that it is possible for all countries on earth to come together to discuss and to define a way forward despite different interests. They are, 
These uh, decisions taken are the strategic antithesis to a world in disarray, a positive alternate alternative to the storyline of decline. Both agreements are also a reminder how important the United Nations is in this interdependent world. All of this makes me hopeful. We have an orientation what to do and what to do better. And if I may so, the reaction of many American states, cities or businesses to the pulling out of the new US administration from the Paris Agreement. Many of them have declared that they remain committed to the emission reduction goals. Gives me hope that at the end, the American people and its powerful economy will be part of this great transformation. I believe in reason in, of, in, with the American people. This underlines another feature of politics in an interdependent world. While nation states and supranational institutions are important, they are not the only import, important actors. It is time that we rediscover the smart principle of subsidiarity, which was first put forward by Catholic social teaching. There can and will never be a global master plan steering humanity towards a better future, one plan. The great transformation gives direction, but in the end, there will be countless decentralized bottom-up transformations which eventually will come together to form a comprehensive whole. And as nobody has all the answers, there will be a learning process of also trial and error. It is the cities and communities which are best positioned for that search process. They are much more flexible in experimenting and finding answers. They are also much closer to citizens, their needs and demands. As laboratories of change, cities could increase the public's ownership and support for the necessary changes. Globalization is not about diffusing responsibility to some ominous global force, but about anchoring awareness of the planet as a whole in local action. Which finally brings me to the question of my title that I have yet to answer. What does it mean to be a citizen in a global age? Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, humans are full of contradictions. We can love and hate at the same time. We often know what is right and still do the wrong thing. When it comes to globalization, we are just as contradictory as the world itself. We give to charities to help poor people in faraway countries but when those people finally manage to find a decent income, we complain about jobs being shipped overseas. We are concerned by climate change, but not quite scared enough to make any changes to our own lifestyles, contributing to it. We enjoy algorithms making our laptops faster, but not algorithms replacing our jobs. We love high interest rates on the money in our pension funds, but we hate the consequences of a financial sector spiraling out of control because it took too many risks. Politics is a reflection of these inherent human paradoxes. Politics stands for all our conflicting needs, hopes, and fears. Democracy is an attempt to reconcile all these different interests coexisting within our societies. What makes the great transformation so difficult is that we do not only need to balance and reconcile these different interests in our, in our societies of, present, of the present, but also across time and space. 
politics in an interdependent age needs to consider the interests not only of the citizens of a specific nation state, but also of those living in other parts of the world. How is this possible if those legitimizing political decisions are only the citizens of that specific nation state? Furthermore, our democracies think in terms of electoral cycles. Elections legitimize political decisions. This is the very foundation on which our system is built. The problem is, however, that policies are made and legitimized at a point in time when their long-term effects were not felt yet. This is why our systems encourage short-term solutions instead of long-term ones. So every generation has to live with the consequences of policies made before them policies which they had no say in. What does this mean in times of irreversible climate change? To make a long story short, our democratic systems are bound by time and space, and yet the solutions which our democracies produce must transcend exactly those boundaries. That's the challenge. This is the core of the dilemma which makes politics in an interdependent age so challenging. And this is why being a citizen in a global age is, is so challenging. Because there simply is no system, no democracy, no dictatorship, no socialism, no capitalism, which would be able to automatically, inherently, magically, produce the perfect solutions for the planet as a whole and for the future generations. And there simply is no system which could make the painful contradictions of human existence go away. There's only us. There's only us. It's up to each and every one of us, as individual citizens, as voters, as consumers, as professionals, as friends, to make decisions each and every day which are responsible. Nobody is a saint. And we all have our share of contradictions. And yet, we live in the best of times with unprecedented physical comfort and health. And so we shouldn't shy away too easily from confronting the responsibilities that come from living in this global age. The German-American philosopher Hans Jonas has described this responsibility already in 1979 when he wrote about the imperative of responsibility. I quote, act so that the effects of your action are compatible with the permanence of genuine human life on earth. This is das Prinzip Verantwortung in German imperative of responsibility. What does that mean concretely in an age where the level of resource consumption in our Western societies could not, by the laws of nature, be adapted by all inhabitants of this earth? What that, does it mean? I'd like to quote another German-American philosopher, quote, since, since universal applicability is the principle of modern ethics, the realization that our lifestyle is not universally applicable can, by modernity's own yardstick, mean nothing other than that it is immoral. It's, it's tough, uh, tough stuff. I repeat this sentence. Since universal applicability is the principle of modern ethics, the realization that our lifestyle is not universally applicable can, by modernity's own yardstick, mean nothing other than that it is immoral. End of quote. 
The philosopher who wrote this is my respected friend, your very own professor, Vittorio Hösle. I'm really <laughs> like very much that you are here. I'm honored that you are here, uh, Professor Hösle. By the way, Professor Hösle might be the smartest German alive, and I'm honored and grateful that he brought me back to Notre Dame. <laughs> Vittorio Hösle then reminds us of the inconvenient truth that there is a structural hypocrisy in the way we in the rich countries are living our lives. And without going further, because I am not a theologian, I have a hunch that the concept of structural sin could be a spiritual equivalent of that truth. This realization should not make us downtrodden and resigned, but should rather encourage us to reconsider some of our lifestyle choices. It's not impossible. Earlier this year, a team of scientists from four American universities calculated that if, if every American made just one straightforward change to their diet, namely substit substituting beans for beef, <laughs> then the U.S. would immediately realize approximately 50 to 75 percent of its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets for the year 2020. It, it's, uh, it's a calculation, and it seems to be funny. I feel it's funny. <laughs> but I quote it. I took it. Um, because I do think we should always reflect not only in the big philosophies, but in very co concrete terms. Now, before anybody gets the chance to write the headline, Köhler says, eat beans, not beef. <laughs> Let me assure you that I don't want to take your beef away. <laughs> but this example shows that meaningful action to tackle climate change or being respectful of the Brazilian rainforest, which is still brutally locked to make space for raising the beef we eat, does not need to be policy driven. Instead, our daily consumer choices and as much as a single dietary change can go long ways and paint a clear path towards our global responsibilities. This doesn't mean living one's life as a kind of perpetual Lent. More often than we think, the good choice is also the economic choice. I have read that 50% of Americans drink bottled water regularly. Also, tap, tap water in most U.S. cities is about 500 times cheaper than bottled water. And 50% of the bottled Expensive water comes actually from tap water. <laughs> Maybe the barriers towards making responsible changes to our lifestyles are not so much in our wallets, but rather in our heads. And in our hearts. This leads me to the final issue I want to touch on tonight. There is a growing debate about the role of national identity, and there is a fear that globalization would lead to a gradual homogenization and the latent demise of distinct cultures. Not least, that fear contributes to the rise of nationalism in many countries. There are three points I would like to make in that debate. First, I have spoken earlier about the need for globalization to be anchored in local action. And I might add now, local identity. Having an awareness of the global context in which I live does not mean to negate my culture or my roots. Quite to the contrary, the better I know who I am, the more I can be open towards others. But the pride in my own culture and heritage must always lead to respect, uh, to respect for the culture 
and heritage of others. Greatness is never achieved by making others small. Second, we shouldn't assume that people are merely passive consumers of cultural influences. Instead, we must begin, begin to understand culture as a multi-layered and organic and we must trust people to be able to actively pick and choose from various cultural influences. Once we do so, we will also find that globalization has all the potential to expand and enrich our cultural identities. And finally, identity is not a binary concept. We can be several things at once. I'm a German, I'm a father, I'm a Protestant, I'm a European, I'm an economist, and so on. And none of these clash with my sense of belonging to humanity as a whole. Some of my Catholic friends have told me, by the way, that they had some of the most spiritual moments when they were in a foreign country and attended mass not speaking the local language, but still being able to follow and to answer the priest in their own language at the appropriate moments. A profound experience of shared tradition and communion, communion which transcends any of our human notions of nationality. Couldn't such experience be a starting point for growing our capacity for empathy and togetherness, a starting point for discovering what we might have in common with people who don't share our language or culture or nationality or religion. Some of you may ask me whether this is not a very elitist, elitist point of view. I would agree to the point that dealing with complexity and living in a global age is extremely complex gets easier for those with a good education. This is exactly why education is a key, a key to coping with the challenges of this century. But I don't believe that compassion is el elitist or the need for clean air or the yearning for peace. I believe that all of these things are deeply human they are sentiments accessible to all of us. Each of us, no matter our background, can grasp that everyone deserves to live, to live a life in dignity. Everyone can grasp that. This is why I don't think that having awareness for humanity as a whole, that being a responsible citizen in a global age is something only for the elites. But before you say this is an easy thing to preach for someone belonging to the elites, let me tell you a story about myself. My parents were simple farmers, members of an ethnic German minority in the Eastern European region of Bessarabia, today the Republic of Moldova. In 1940, 1940 they were lured by the Nazis to return to the Reich. Instead of a glorious new beginning on German soil, they had to spend two years in a transition camp in Austria and were then sent to Poland as part of a sick plan to Germanize this region. They were put in a farmhouse, a house from which the Polish owners had been forced out, of, out at gunpoint just a few hours before my parents moved in. I was born half a year later. In the hard winter of 1944-45, when the Red Army was approaching, my family fled from Poland to East Germany. And in 1953, after having a row with a local communist party official, we fled again in secrecy to West Germany, where my parents hoped to live and freedom. We spent a few years in several refugee camps. 
before the family was given a small apartment when I was 13 years old. Finally, a place I could call home. More than 30 years later, in 1990, I was sitting in Moscow in front of over a dozen and even more Red Army generals and admirals. I had just become State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of Finance a few months earlier, and I was tasked with negotiating the withdrawal of the Soviet troops from East, Eastern Germany. A success, a success in those negotiations would be crucial for the agreement of the major powers, including Russia, on German unification. I hadn't re received much guidance for the talks. Chancellor Helmut Kohl had given me just one direction, and I learned how important this direction was. His words had been, respect the Red Army. They freed uh, our country, their country from the, German, from the Germans. Respect the Red Army always. I had to think of my late mother, who never was very fond of the Russians. <laughs> there I was, negotiating with the army my parents had once fled Think about, uh, had um, once fled with me as a baby, negotiating for them to peacefully withdraw from the country my family escaped when I was a 10 year old. When we reached an agreement, after several <laughs> quite tough rounds of negotiations, I felt a peculiar mix of amazement and gratitude. Amazement and gratitude about the ability of humans to overcome difference and adversity, to respect each other for both their sameness and their uniqueness, to listen to each other, to learn, to trust each other, and to muster the courage to take a step into the unknown. I have felt that I have felt that, that mix of sentiments many times in my life, most of all when I met people from other countries. I felt it when I looked in the face of national leaders who had to make the difficult decisions of accepting an IMF pro program or not. I felt it when I spoke as German president with Holocaust survivors in Israel. I felt it meeting African women who raised their children with unimaginable perseverance and dignity, despite all this extreme poverty. I'm also feeling it today, amazement and gratitude, having spent several days at this great institution, meeting a lot of curious young people, I liked it very much, their curiosity, and some inspiring professors. All of you have shown a level of curiosity, of openness, and of caring about the challenges of our times that has impressed me deeply. Meeting people like you always makes me feel hopeful for the future of the human race. Hopeful that there is a way to overcome poverty and protect the planet, despite the systemic mess this world seems to be in. There is, of course, a way. In the past days here at Notre Dame, I often had to think about the powerful words of Saint Augustine. He once wrote, and I quote Augustine, bad, bad times, hard times. This is what people keep saying. But let us live well, and times shall be good. We are the times, such as we are, such are the times. I thank you very much.
just a practice. It's the only microphone I have. So, the Notre Dame student body. I am in charge of uh, refereeing the questions. We have 14 minutes, which are passing. We have 14 minutes. That means we will take extremely short questions, preferably of one sentence and no speeches, <laughs> and uh, give President Kuller time to speak. It is also the tradition of the Nanavik Institute and the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study that we call on students first of all. So, what questions do we have from students? Yes, sir. Uh, President Keller, uh, thank you for coming to our institution. We are very proud uh, to uh, listen to you here. And uh, Mike, uh, I'm Rodion, uh, I'm from uh, East Europe, international student here, and uh, we face um, many of the problems that you described. Do you think uh, it is better to refer to people who uh, support you in this situation in order to make change, or uh, to refer to people who do not understand you, and do not understand the values that we share? Because uh, actually, we know what we want to do, but they don't. Know. Yeah, well, to be honest, I am invited, I am honored to be here, and I'm sure there are also people here who, not, will, who will not agree with every, everything I have said. If not, I would be kind of irritated, <laughs> because I have not all the truth and uh, uh, so. Uh, but. I can assure you, I speak with people who have different views. And this is a bit lacking in our political culture, that everybody speaks in the group where he feels familiar with. We call it the bubble. Everybody lives in a bubble, his own bubble. And we have to overcome this kind of bubble uh, culture, where the bubbles don't communicate really. And when the bubble then explodes, then all of a sudden, all of us are in a mess. So I apologize that I may have not, uh, say, given a voice to more critical comments which are possible to my ideas. But I will think for the next speech how, how I can improve. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm a labor lawyer from India and I represent workers in the global supply chain. Uh, we have found it very, very easy to work with German coalitions made of brands or trade unions of NGOs. Where does that consciousness come from? Because it is lacking in the rest of the world. And the second question is that more than globalization, don't you think capitalism is a challenge to diversity everywhere just because of its need to create homogeneous consumers across the globe? Um, capitalism is something which uh, is there for since over a century. Uh, well understood capitalism has brought a lot of uh, progress. But I made clear in my speech that there have to be rules for capitalism. And the problem of uh, the situation is that too often those who make the best for their own lives and their profit with capitalism don't care too much about the others who have not such a good situation. And therefore, we need to be critical with capitalism, give capitalism rules. We call it in Germany not the free market economy, but the social market economy. And I would even add today an ecological social market economy. That's my answer to a capitalism which may have also the bad sides.
Thanks. That was the first question, but take it as an answer to both questions. <laughs> So I understood the question that, uh, say, the Facebook discussion about the status of the world is more lively, more interesting than such kind of speech I just gave. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, he, he, he just told me I didn't understand you correctly. <laughs> um, but. It's, it's, it's a serious question. Um, populism against reason. And how do we uh, prevail with reason? It is just always face questions, face criticism, face the un, uh, other view, uh, and don't give in. Um, and uh, I have, in principle, um, yeah, I'm optimistic when I look to your view here, and getting to know the young people, the students, I don't want to be paternalistic young people and the old guy. Um, I am encouraged what I heard and the curiosity of your people here, the students, makes to me at least clear there's a good chance that reason will prevail. And you should take it as a kind of your mandate, the youth, to fight for reason against populism. Okay, thank you. Hi, I am um, um, an Irish alum. I was conceived in Ireland, but born in the United States. I routinely house international students who study who I think make the world a better place. But I'm really challenged as all the many parts of my person as we all are. Is it more important in a global community um, if it were a movie and you were the, uh, the representative of the Martians and I were the representative of the Earth, is it more important that I come under the banner of an Earthling or as a citizen of the United States? When, does, when do we grow in a, in a global world? When is it more important to be human or to be a citizen of any nation? That's where I think the confusion, at least for me, lies. Thank you so much. Well, my answer is... We are always humans. And therefore, humanity for humans is beyond a nation. That's my personal position. But we are organized in nations. And nations and cultures give us roots. And therefore, the question is I, not either or. The question is how we as humans, and this is the decisive point, we are born as humans. And this is what God wants us to be humans. Uh, that we use our humanity, our intellects, our empathy, to be able as also then citizens of nations be so reasonable that we are able to organize the life between nations, citizens of different um, nations for a decent life together. So that is my answer to this question. I wouldn't uh, think there is a, an importance either in humans or to be a member of a nation. Make the best out of your membership in, Amer in America or in Ireland, and you will see it works as a human. 
we have time for one more question. And if good, because I'd like to turn over to the Mayor of Lake Park. Is it right here? Yes. Oh. How in practice do we balance national sovereignty, people trying to do what's best for them versus making small sacrifices that make the world better? You use the example of beans and beef. How do we decide when we need to enact policy that might cause us to sacrifice things we like for the betterment of the world? Well, the big uh, decisions uh, taken at the national level or at the international level have always to be taken by governments, uh, representatives of a nation, a democracy. And I, do, I see no better organizational principle than a democracy, meaning that we need to be uh, able to send representatives to the level of a nation um, and they ne then express also the will, hopefully, of the individuals. But I try to, to say that if there is not an understanding of citizens, that they are also in charge for their own life, that's responsibility, then whatever they decide at the level of a government or uh, international institutions, it will not work. And the other way around, if there is a reasonable, let's say, concept how to organize this transformation, that was my point. It will only work and be, uh, lead to good ex, uh, results if everybody of us is participating, takes it on, on board, defines what it means for him personally. And if this process comes, uh, say, in, in everybody's uh, mind, then I think we have already uh, one half of the process because uh, no government today knows all of these things which have to uh, change. And you, every individual on his and her uh, environment, home and neighborhood and friendship, will detect what they can in order to be part of this transformation. That's my answer. And just give us ideas how you see your individual life changing in the light of this kind of problems. Thank you. <laughs> President Kuller, I'm really at a loss for words after listening to your words. When we invite people to Notre Dame, when we invite prominent people to Notre Dame, we always think about who has the experience. And a lot of people have experience. And then we think about who has the wisdom. And maybe fewer people with experience have the wisdom. But because we are Notre Dame, we also ask ourselves, who has heart? And you mentioned heart in your lecture, beautifully. And we like to believe that at Notre Dame, heart, human heart, is all part of what we call the Notre Dame family, that we are people with compassion, people with a heart, people who want to make the world better. And so, to put it simply, I would like to welcome your wife, your daughter, and you to the Notre Dame family. So, I will just add a couple more remarks. Um, no, you can't leave. <laughs> no, no, you have to come back. Um, 
You know, I, wa I want to say uh, that this is one of those glorious opportunities when different parts of the university can come together uh, to uh, bring a real spark, an intellectual warm spark to our lives. And what you see is the product of the collaboration of the uh, Mendoza College of Business, uh, and in particular, the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, and of course, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Many people have played an essential role in putting this whole event together. And I know he will be embarrassed, but I would in particular like to single out our friend, wherever he is, Don Stoluto. <laughs> Hiding right there. What you see is the product of Don Stoluto's blood, sweat, tears, passion, and heart. And so now I would like to welcome uh, Brad up to the stage and, and Don, and we have a small presentation. And Roger, of course, Roger. Well, I, uh, I would like to say, on the one hand, I feel it's like almost Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other side, I want to say, it gives me a good feeling I should come back. Yeah. President Köhler, at this time, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies and the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study would like to present you with a gift in appreciation for your being a part of the campus this week and for sharing with the university community your thoughts, your compassion, your humor, your inspiration, and even time with your wonderful family. The gift that we have for you is a, a very special gift. In April of 1879, the University of Notre Dame's main building was destroyed by fire, and the university's founder, Father Edward Soren, oversaw that summer the rebuilding of a much larger replacement building, the current main building. It's known to many simply as the Golden Dome. Gold as a color can represent wealth for some, but gold also symbolizes accomplishment, higher ideals such as wisdom and understanding, knowledge, spirituality, generosity, and the sharing of our gifts with others. May this artwork, which represents and displays the Golden Dome, be for you a reminder of your visit this week, of the indomitable spirit of the people of this place, and that like you, we also value wisdom, understanding, spirituality, generosity, and join in that responsibility for sharing our gift with others. This work of art was made not by machines, but by a local artist, by her hands. It therefore has an artist's touch and an artist's imperfections. Yet as a work of art in those imperfections, it also displays beauty, character, depth, and a story. For several decades, you have witnessed many of the imperfections to be found in humanity. And your story, just a, a, a sliver of your personal story is that compelling story. Yet as your engagement with the university this week has revealed many times over, you continue to believe in humanity and to see in it beauty, character, depth, and a compelling set of stories. May this simple gift of ours remind you that we too appreciate the complexity of the human story, and like you, we seek to be a force for good in the world, fostering beauty, goodness, truth, and character. On behalf of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies and the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study, thank you, President Kula, for being with us this week and for all that you continue to do in this world. 
may you know that you always have friends and colleagues here at the University of Notre Dame.